Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Today, we turn to a corner of New York's history that was unknown to most New Yorkers until the 1960s, when it was unearthed house by house through the efforts of historians, public school children, Brooklyn residents, and anthropologists. The area was known as Weeksville, and it thrived as an independent community of free African Americans from before the Civil War until its gradual absorption into the borough of Brooklyn after the war. Weeksville residents included property owners, entrepreneurs, and strivers of all kinds who believed they had to live separately in order to pursue the American dream. The story of these citizens, the buildings they built, and the lives they lived is told by Judith Wellman, Professor Emerita of the State University at Oswego in her book, Brooklyn's Promised Land, The Free Black Community of Weeksville, New York, it's just been published by New York University Press. Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor so, to be here. So tell me, why was Weeksville started, when, and where exactly was it? Well, it was started in the 1930s in the context of the end of slavery in New York State. A lot of people still don't realize New York State had slavery officially until 1927. The answer of a lot of white people to the question of race in this country at that time was to, to raise money, free enslaved people, and send them to Africa. And that's the origin of the, the city or the country of Liberia today. Monrovia is named after James Monroe, the U.S. president. And a lot of African Americans, especially in the Northeast in the early 19, 1830s, gathered in meetings that were a huge opposition meetings to this uh, idea of going to Africa. They said, our families have been here for five generations. We're staying with the bones of our ancestors. We're he we've been here longer than you are. We're, we're colored Americans. That's where that term came from. We're American citizens who happen to be people of color. And in that context, a few um, people in Brooklyn, African Americans, who had some money, Henry Thompson, um, uh, Sylvanus Smith, decided they would leverage that money and buy property in an area that was just being sold by the Lefferts family, who were a Dutch-American um, family that had been here from the 17th century. Their house is still standing at Prospects. Prospect and it was farmland. Park. Yeah, farmland. And so they bought this land and they began to sell it for colored people to colored people, they said. And they created, beginning in the mid-30s until the Civil War, an African-American community that by the mid-50s had over 500 people in it, with 82% black. It was a black churches, black school, and then became a black, they had a black orphanage, a home for the aged. And it was a very successful alternative to living Going back in the to Africa. culture. Or, right. yeah. Or right. living in the predominant culture where there right. was still a lot of, right. of racism. Yep. So the the first residents, you had the recently freed slaves from New York State. Were they also, who else were there, escaped slaves from the South? Were there oh, West yeah. Indians? Cheryl, this is the part, uh, the, every book is a beginning, it's not an end. So I hope people will take these questions. How did African Americans hear about this community? Because they came, New York State was a, certainly a lot of them were born locally, but there's a huge contingent from South Carolina. A lot of people were from Maryland, from Virginia. A couple people listed their birthplaces as Africa. Some from Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C. And they were really a very cosmopolitan community in this essentially Dutch African farmland of Long Island. Here's this extremely world-wide um, community of people who come. One of the things that seems clear is that a lot of them did escape from slavery and came to Weeksville as a place of safety. But other people came for other reasons. Um, this man, uh, Francis Prince Graham from South Carolina was in South Carolina in 1822. He was accused of being part of the Denmark Vesey Rebellion. He had gone to New York, but he came back to, to Charleston to stand trial. He said, if I'm guilty, why would I come back? Well, they found him guilty anyway. They didn't hang him. 
uh, but they sent him on a ship called the Dolphin to Liberia. That was his option. So he went to Liberia, and then he came back, and then eventually in 1839 he invested, and he becomes this, the largest African-American landowner who actually lives in Weeksville. Fascinating guy, an AME, an AME minister, a shoemaker. He lists his occupation as shoemaker, but he owns this, lots of all this property and these lots. So where did these African-Americans, not that long out of bondage, get the money to buy this property? That's a good question, too, and we don't know. I guess uh, they just worked hard. Worked hard and saved it. Um, uh, some of it, like Sylvanus Smith, was uh, his office was downtown Pearl Street in Brooklyn. He had a butcher shop, and but he bought a lot of this land as a hog farm, so it was connected to his downtown work. And I guess and, the land was cheap. And land was cheap. Land was very cheap because it was on, one of the interesting things to me, it was on a glacial moraine. Brooklyn and Long Island had these glacial moraines, very steep um, hills. And in fact, when they did the excavation in the 1960s, they found a Revolutionary War cannonball in the backyard of one of those houses because it had been one of the main routes for the British to go when they were um, attacking George Washington and trying to drive him out. Successfully, they did, of New York City. So it, it was part of Brooklyn's history in terms of the Revolution and beyond. And But at the time of the sales, it was steep farmland. Most of the woods had been cut down by the British for firewood. So it was for sale, and then the Lefferts family, the John Lefferts died, and so they put a lot of this land for right. sale. So. Now, most of the African Americans who were the first settlers of Weeksville, they were not farmers. No. So what did they do for a living? You can see it's, it's uh, there were about 100 of these African American independent communities before the Civil War, quite remarkable, all over. All the ones we can identify were farm agriculturally based except Weeksville. And Weeksville was laid out not in 15 or 40 acres for farms, but in small 100 foot lots for sale as a suburban. Weeksville was a suburb of Brooklyn. It's like four miles from the docks. So people, and, and the Long Island Railroad, the oldest still operating railroad in the US, goes right by Weeksville. And so Weeksville residents could get on the omnibus, the horse-drawn cars, or the railroad, go to downtown Brooklyn. Or, so they worked all over mm -hmm. in a whole variety of occupations. I think the 1865 census lists 50 different occupations mm -hmm. for people in Weeksville and 100% employment. Right. Just wow. amazing. A lot of laborers, but also skilled craftsmen and some people who worked on the, on the, the docks. docks. Right. Yeah, and right. a steward on the ships. And, a lot of people were were shoemakers, which I can't quite figure out, but they're listed as shoemakers, bootmakers. Mm -hmm. Something's going on there. And it was a thriving community. Yes, it was. Not an impoverished one. Oh, no. Mm -mm. They had a um, two churches, AME and Baptist Church, and then later St. Philip's in the early 20th century. They had a school that became really such a good school that... Um, college school number two. College school number two in Brooklyn. And mm -hmm. then it became um, PS 83, which was known nationally in education circles because Maricha Lyons became the assistant principal. And she supervised student teachers who were black teachers as well as white teachers. It wasn't the first integrated school in New York State, but it was the first one to have an integrated teacher training program. An integrated student body as yeah, well. An integrated student body, yes. And it had a home for the aged, and then it had, which be, it's still, that's building still standing. They built a new one in 1900. It's on St. So Jesus it place. reached its peak in the 1850s with about 500 residents. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and well, let's talk more about the institutions that they created. Um, obviously, a number of churches, including AME churches. Mm -hmm. Was the AME church founded because African Methodist Episcopal, because blacks did not, were not accepted at Methodist and Episcopal churches? Yes, that's, that's one of the reasons. And um, AME Zion was founded about the same time for basically the same reason. And they became real nests of education and training and community organization out of which came 
one of the things that surprised me was a lot of women leaders who were associated with Weeksville as well as men. And so that church became a key part of the community and a base for. So other institutions, you had the school and there was an orphanage, the Howard Orphanage, um, the African Civilization Society, what was that? What did they do? In 1857, a group, by this time, people from outside Weeksville, most of Weeksville's first generations were, we, we wouldn't recognize their names today. One of my favorite is, is Lydia Elizabeth Sis, uh, Sisson Dixon LeGrant. Okay. <laughs> um, no one's heard of her, but she's a wonderful woman. By the 1850s, with the success of Weeksville, African-American leaders that everyone would recognize, Henry Highland Garnett, Martin Delaney, are beginning to realize Weeksville is a powerful place. And they, so in 1857, they create there the headquarters of the African Civilization Society. And they decide that they, in the context, this is in the context of the Fugitive Slave Act, um, and uh, uh, what, what they're feeling is tremendous pressure on African Americans in this country. They revive the idea of going to Africa. And this time it's going to be under African American control. It's not going to be the American Colonization Society with white people raising the money and telling them where they have to go and what they have to do. This is African Americans. And so they think Weeksville as this African American community is a, a fine place to put the national headquarters for this. And they do. As, but as a result of the Civil War, people like Martin Delaney, Henry Highland Garnett actually joined the Army. And th then they turned the African Civilization Society into a group that helps promote teachers, sending teachers to free people of color who are coming out of slavery after the war. So, so their focus shifted its yeah, from, its from focus. immigration to right. helping the blacks here. Right. And they also had um, the Zion Home for the Aged. Right which had it ups, its ups and downs. Yes, it did. It was formed by a group of people from New York City who really couldn't maintain it. And by the 1880s, it was in really poor condition. And this was, uh, this is one of the surprises of the book to me, that in the 1880s, there was a woman, Margaret Bottom, she was a white woman. She formed a group um, w which was circles of women in Protestant churches all around the country and they and black women and white women and they would take uh, projects in 1888 they took as a project the Zion home for the aged one of the newspaper journalists I was so impressed he said there's nothing quite so likely to be successful in Brooklyn as a project in which women are interested and so they raised this money and they built a brand new beautiful building and in uh, 1900, that's still standing, to create a home for the aged that became the Brooklyn Home for the Aged. And what I realized was what we're looking at in this local place is the beginning of the National Progressive Movement, which started with these kinds of social reform, social justice projects in small communities all over the country. And like most progressive reform activities, they were um, cross-class, they involved working class people, homeless people, right. middle class people. They involved women as well as men. They involved blacks as well as whites. And what we're seeing is the way this worked itself out in Weeksville. And so people like Susan McKinney Smith Stewart, who was a daughter of Sylvanus Smith, one of the original landowners, became one of the earliest African-American, one of the earliest women doctors, and she was African-American, and she became the doctor for Zion Home for the Aged. Mm -hmm. So it's um, a kind of generational development and also a powerful example of why the progressive movement was so successful and maybe what we might learn something about for, from the progressives for today's mm -hmm. <laughs> efforts. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Dr. Judith Wellman, author of Brooklyn's Promised Land, after this message. <music> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Judith Wellman, author of Brooklyn's Promised Land, the free black community of Weeksville, New York. So how did the Civil War change? What kind of impact did it have on Weeksville? Weeksville, like every other community in this country, was powerfully affected by the Civil War. 
The first major event is um, a disastrous one, actually. The <clears throat> federal government's attempt to draft people in 1863 did not include drafting African Americans. And so the, a lot of, of whites, especially Irish, in New York City were subject to the draft. African Americans weren't. There was a draft riot which resulted in the deaths and uh, burning of the black orphanage in New York City. It's one reason the orphanage moved to Brook Weeksville after the war. Um, and people fled downtown Manhattan in desperation for their lives. And many of them came to Weeksville, which became a kind of haven, a center. And there, is, there was still standing into the early 20th century an old stone um, windmill, which was reputed to be one of the safe havens for African Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, Junius C. Morrell, the teacher in Weeksville, became part of a group to raise money and also then to um, work as what they call the Vigilance Committee to help people escape from slavery, a uh, committee of 13, which was very, very active in New York, and a lot of it was African Americans on the ground. And, and Weeksville was a haven, a, one of the, a, an important stop on the Underground Railroad. Yes. Um, we don't have any um, stories, so-and-so came on such-and-such -such a night and stayed with somebody else from uh, about Weeksville, but the powerful evidence to me is its population numbers. It's got the largest proportion of African Americans who list their birthplaces as a southern state of any community except Buffalo, which was right on the border, um, Pittsburgh, which was on the Ohio River, and Cleveland, which was right to going um, toward Canada, an important stop right across from slave states, states that had slavery. So we think that a large proportion of those people had come from the South as a, and using Weeksville mm -hmm. as a safe haven. Now, Weeksville had some remarkable leaders. You mentioned Junius Morrell, who uh, was the principal of colored school number two. They were so multi-talented. I mean, he, yeah. for one thing, he was uh, also, a, he was a principal, he was a journalist, he was an activist. You had, you mentioned Maricha Lyons. She was the assistant principal of the school she, uh, who supervised black and white teachers. She was also a public speaker. Was she the one who was an organist as well, or was that the doctor? That was Susan McKinney-Stewart, the doctor, yes. Okay, uh, and Tima Kant stewart who was a lawyer, a minister, president of the Brooklyn Literary Union, uh, on the Brooklyn School Board and helped develop Liberia's legal code, was Associate Justice of the Liberian Supreme Court for a while. Some very talented people. Aren't they amazing? They are amazing. I mean, who would think this whole project started with four little houses that remained from Weeksville, and it, it's one of those places, the more you look, you say, they were in Weeksville? He was in Weeksville. Right. <laughs> it became such a generative force for change in the larger world. And it did have this persistent connection with Liberia. Henry Highland Garnett went to Liberia and died there, actually, as well. So it's got um, a kind of worldwide echoes. It's like this little stone in the pond of Weeksville has ripples that go far. And, and a lot of the residents had lived, you know, had been to many different places, I guess, which is typical, you know, a journey after slavery. You're trying to reestablish yourself and you go to this place and you go to another place and you go to Africa for a while, you come back, and, but uh, a lot of them live many places. Why did Weeksville disappear? Well, it's, it's again, a, a, a mystery. Who would know? I, um, it turns out that Brooklyn and the middle and New York City and cities in general in the U.S. after the Civil War are expanding rapidly. And Brooklyn in particular has a nice grid system and it's trying to move the grid east because it's the only way it can grow. And to do that, it builds Eastern Parkway in the 1870s, builds the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883. And it's very clear that this hilly, extremely rural area that's Weeksville is right in the way of the city of Brooklyn. And sure enough, by the 1880s and 90s, there's a total rebuilding. They cut the top off the hills. They put the soil into the valleys. They flatten it out. If you go to Weeksville today in Bedford-Stuyvesant, um, you will not see 
any remains of the original landscape. It was physically wiped out. You and a lot of the houses system. had to be removed because they were they, just yes, sort of... Yes, they did. And that everywhere. leads to another mystery. The story that everyone thought was that these buildings, architects look at these buildings and they say, oh, they're pre-Civil War buildings. They have post and beam construction, interior fireplaces, cut nails, 1840s. Um, Archaeologists have studied, Joan Geismer's done a lot of work in this, uh, this area, and they can't find any evidence of human habitation on the site of the current Hunterfly Road houses in Weeksville before the 1860s. So you say, well, one of them has to be wrong. Both of them are right. As you begin to realize with the expansion of the grid, they, nobody throws houses out. You've got to use them. You just move them. Mm -hmm. You put them on the grid so they're placed. But Hunterfly Road still goes crossways to the grid, which is one reason they were able to, to find it. And in fact, these, they were built before the Civil War. In 1863, when this land was sold to a German architect, carpenter named Frederick Volkening, there was nothing on that land. Uh, and this is all in the Brooklyn Eagle and in the deeds and in the assessment records. And the first assessment that shows anything there is 1874. So Frederick Volkening, this German-born carpenter, buys up these little houses in the area that are being moved, and he moves them here, puts them right along the road, fixes them up, right. which explains why there's some similarities among them all. And they were in his estate until the 1960s, until they were purchased. Okay. So you had all the, the, the creation of Brooklyn and all of this building and the moving of the houses, but you also had the influx of a lot of white residents to the area. You do, yeah. This is a period when Irish, German, especially in later Italian, uh, some Chinese come into the area and they start living and buying houses, renting houses next door to African Americans. And it becomes, for many years, uh, an integrated community and then now it's an African-American community, once more a center of African-American life. But it became a mostly white community for a while, right? It did. The dominant, yes, the largest proportion. I think the proportion of African-Americans in that little village dropped from 82% to 6.5%. Wow. Something like that. So, wow. Mm -hmm. So Weeksville, the sort of independent black community, disappeared for a while. I mean, for a long time. How was it rediscovered. In the 1960s, a man named James Hurley, who's still living, had been uh, in Pakistan, had done aerial photography, um, started teaching a class in local history. He got a couple of students, Dolores McCulloch, Pat Johnson, who started working in Weeksville. They looked at old maps and they noticed this road, Hunterfly Road, that went cross lots. It's the oldest road that's still anything left in that area of Brooklyn because it went across the top of the moraine. And then they got a man named Joseph Haynes, who was an African-American pilot, and took them over and they took pictures and it hit the New York Times. And then the rest is history, I think, as people began to that realize they saw, they saw there's these something houses here. Yes, there's there. something here. And the whole, there was a real community effort uh, which led to the purchase of four Weeksville houses uh, and the creation of what's now the Weeksville Heritage Center. Um, just all kinds of, who were some of the people involved in this project? Uh, one of the, the favorites, I think, of everyone, she's assumed uh, almost mythical status, was Joan Maynard, who became the director very early of the Society for the Preservation of Weeksville and Bedford-Stuyvesant History. And I first met her in the 70s when a friend of mine took me out there and I still see her walking down the stairs of the, the one little two-story house on Hunterfly Road. And she remained director until the early 20th century and uh, restored the houses. They had Alex Haley out for a fundraising, constant issues with raising money and still are, so if people want to help them out, they know how to do it <laughs> and go visit as well. Uh, then Pam Green became director and uh, she called me because they wanted to put through Save America's Treasures the buildings on the National Register, and that's how I got Okay. Um, we've got about two minutes left. Um, you're a white woman who teaches upstate mm -hmm. and who got interested in, in, in this week's full project to write a book about it. Were there any things that surprised you about what you found? I think 
probably the biggest surprise, there were many things, but, but since we only have two minutes, the biggest surprise was that it was so successful and that its message, I think, extends not just from this local community, but it transcends it to, the, to speak to us today as citizens of this world about how we can best implement ideals of equality, of justice for all people, of respect for all people. They did it there. They took a path that was a separatist path rather than an integrationist path, but ultimately it comes around to us and, and we realize that their model for creating this world offers something that challenges us to think about how best we can work toward those goals as well. And so people can visit the four houses. Yes. Are they open every day to the public? I or? don't think they're open this winter. I think they've closed for the winter. They're having a grand opening of a brand new exhibit by Cynthia Copeland's working on this in May. And they have a farm with a farmer's market, lots of cultural activities of music and art. And because it's not just the houses, it's, it's a cultural yes, center. Yes, it's a brand new Heritage cultural center. center that's open there. Um, Tia Harris is the new director. And everyone go because it's a wonderful place. It's in Bedford-Stuyvesant, but it's a world-class site and not to be missed. Okay. Fascinating story. And it's sort of like I read it and it was like, who knew? Who knew? Thank you for telling us the story. Thank you. We're out of time. I want to thank Judith Wellman, whose book, Brooklyn's Promised Land, The Free Black Community of Weeksville, New York, has just been published by New York University Press. If you'd like more information about Weeksville, go to weeksvillesociety.org. And for conversation about the book, to fromthesquare.org. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.